Hello everyone, welcome to our Sundance 2020 recap video. Look who I'm sharing this table with. I've got Mance and Snyder with me. How you guys doing? Oh, we're just dandy. It's because we've all slept since getting home yes. from the Sundance <laughs> Film Festival 2020 and we're ready to talk about our three favorite movies of the festival. We each picked three in no particular order here. We're gonna pass it around the table and go one by one. Mance, what's the first movie you wanna talk about I today? gotta talk about Pop Springs. Pop Springs is a movie that turned out to be the hot ticket at Sundance and it paid off Hence the word paid is the key word here mm -hmm. because it wound up being the biggest acquisition in Sundance history when it was picked up by both Hulu and Neon, the studio behind Parasite, for $17.5 million and 69 cents, beating the previous record holder, which was Birth of a Nation from Searchlight Pictures a few years ago. I love this movie. It's charming. It's okay. In terms of are you going to go into a synopsis for this one? No. Be careful. Yeah. That's oh, what I'm oh, saying. Yeah. Okay. All I'll say. I'm sure it's out there already, but I would advise folks to go okay. in not knowing as much as they possibly can. Yeah, what I'll say is it is a romantic comedy that's a little different from what we've seen in romantic comedies. Mm -hmm. Not different from what we've seen in maybe two or three films over the years that have established this type of approach to telling a story over and over and over again. But- that's a big hint right there. Okay. But I thought that Andy Samberg and Krista Milotti, Milotti, who was in a, she was in a great episode of uh, Black Mirror, the Star Trek. Uh, Probably, yeah, spoof. one of your favorites. Yes, that was, that was terrific. But I just thought this was a really, for especially by Sundance terms, because usually Sundance movies can be very heavy, mm -hmm. very deep, you know, dysfunctional family type of things, or very dark, sometimes disturbing. And here was something that was really super fun and funny and uh, I, I love the hell out of it. See, but it is, it's super fun and entertaining. But the reason why this one was so stuck in my mind after I saw it is because I do think it has a really meaningful tinge to it where, you know, if you're kind of in a situation in your life where you're, you're stuck in a rut and can't move on or you're not letting other people into your life, this kind of gets at that in a very entertaining manner. Yes, it I does. think that it's, you know, laugh all you want about the 69 cent thing. I think it's probably one of the smartest sales of the festival that I've seen in a while because I do think this has wide big screen appeal, but it's also going to wind up being one of those comedies that you could just watch over and over and over again. So I think that this was a brilliant move and I'm excited for this one to get out in the world. Hence so, the word over and over yeah, that we, you just used. So we share, we share a similar first pick for the show, but Jeff, you've got something different for us? I sure do. Uh, not just in terms of the movies, but I am going to dispute the purchase price on Palm Springs. Oh, what is it? It, it was 17 and a half million and 69 cents, but I don't think, I don't consider that a record, Mance, because Hulu is part of the deal. It counts, that's streaming rights. Birth of a Nation was for theatrical only, mm -hmm. unless Birth of a Nation's uh, rights were, or the, the streaming rights were worth less than 69 cents. I'm not buying the press release. Uh, not okay. buying All it. right, okay, fair enough. Number one for me was Assassins, the documentary, no surprise. Sundance just named a new festival director, Tabitha Jackson, who has been running the documentary program for the last six years. Uh, she has done a fantastic job with that program, and Assassins was terrific. It's about the two women who were accused of uh, murdering Kim Jong-un's half-brother in broad daylight in an airport, and the twists and turns of this story takes are just uh, really incredible. Do you know uh, if that was picked up, if it's got distribution Yeah, it got bought by uh, Magnolia, who I think you know has really good taste in documentaries, yep. probably a low seven-figure deal. Um, I think it's from Ryan White, who may have done The Case Against Eight years back. Uh, I think of some other cool documentaries, too, but this was just... You know, the kind of thing that would have been perfect for Netflix. I'm surprised that, that Netflix didn't jump on it. Um, you know, maybe they just wanted that, that theatrical release. And I think that this is something that deserves to be on, uh, seen on the big screen. That was one of my uh, few regrets of Sundance, not making enough time for documentaries. Yeah, yeah. ditto. Yeah, but you know. We lived in the interview suite. Whatever was and matched up there is what we had to listen, go with. I, I understand that, Perry. Like, I, I probably wouldn't have seen any docs, you know, if, it, if they weren't, like, you know, up against some uh, narrative films that didn't have the greatest buzz. So, you know, the, the next doc that I'll end up talking about, I had blown off D. Reese's movie with Anne Hathaway mm -hmm. and Ben Affleck in order to see it. Do you want to take number two yeah, then yeah, and sure. go we, into your well, second? We can talk about it right now. It's, yeah, uh, it, it. it's the documentary Into the Deep, which is a Netflix documentary. I don't know when Sweet. they're probably going to uh, release it, maybe in the spring or early summer. Uh, but that's about the inventor, Peter Madsen, who, you know, was putting together submarines and rockets on his own time. 
And he had a whole like, community of young people who were helping him and, and volunteer, uh, as volunteers. And then one day, uh, you know, Peter takes out a journalist to, to do an interview on his submarine and only one of them comes back. And it's about this, this journalist's uh, disappearance, and I don't want to spoil anything, but the, the twists and turns in this one were even more dramatic. Um, it, it is just a wild story. So, so try not to read too much about both of these documentaries before you go into them so you can actually be surprised. I remember you telling me about that second one in, wow. the, in the suite, and I, try, I tried so hard to find a spot that it fit into my schedule, and it just didn't work. But I'm glad to hear it's going to be on Netflix because that's – where I'm going to watch it when it comes out. There you yep. go. <laughs> I am a little surprised that my number two movie wasn't on anyone's list. Did any of you see Minari? No, no. I didn't. But oh, it that's won the top okay. Two that's why. Yeah. At the Sun it won the uh, audience award and the grand jury prize this, for narrative feature. For for ranking purposes, this was my favorite film of the festival, and I can't stop thinking about it. It's about a uh, a Korean family, and it takes place in the 1980s. They move from California to Arkansas, where they're going to have the opportunity to live the American dream and create a farming business of their own, and basically not be working under anybody else or in any other. Condition conditions that they don't want to be working for anymore, but it's all about how that goal to achieve the American dream conflicts with what's best for the family and the rift that it costs, uh, it creates within the family. But there are amazing performances across the board in this. Stephen Yun from Walking Dead is just something else. But you might, if you've read anything about Minari, another thing you might have seen is that the young star in it, uh, Alan uh, Kim, is just he is phenomenal he plays the youngest child in it and what happens is his grandmother comes over from korea and and his character is american born so mm -hmm. he has all of these assumptions about what a typical grandmother should be like and she comes over from korea and basically upends all of that and they don't really get along and it's just one of the ch most charming on-screen relationships i've seen in a while so this is a very special one, comes from A24. I'm really hoping that they mount a really big push behind it because I think everyone should see it. And yeah. based on what I saw at Sundance this year, if anything has the chance to go all the way, this could be it. I think this is gonna continue to build buzz go as we the get- way. All the way? You know, it, <laughs> it's tough to say that when we saw so few movies from Sundance last year actually get Oscar oh, nominations. Like but when I'm, yeah. when I'm just like weighing their chances based on the quality of the film, this is the one that I would at least put my money, my money behind this early in the year. How are so, the costumes? The... <laughs> Did costumes. you say, how are the costumes? How are the costumes? <laughs> Why? Because we sat 80s. next to the costume designer on the way home, Susanna Song, who did oh, the costumes okay. for Minari, and she also uh, designed that little boy's I was like, where's he going? Amazing red say... carpet look. Did you see, like, the, the from the premiere, the photos? He was in his little red uh, oh, yeah, cowboy yeah. outfit. She was wonderful, Susanna thought... Song. She's going to come up to the office, and, and we're going to give her a tour. Really? Yeah. Was this on your flight home? Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. I thought you were really, going to really... say something obnoxious about our costume conversation with the Oscars Not this year. Oh, I'm really excited to, to give Susanna a tour of the oh. studio and I can't wait to see Minari. I've heard nothing but good things and it yeah. sounds like it may have the stuff, you know, to, that, that we're, we're talking about this movie 11 months from now. Well, now I can't wait for her to come in so I can congratulate her a in A genuine note from your the, already, the ice will already be broken because you sat next to her. <laughs> Boom. All right, Vance, what's your number okay. two? You just said a movie that could go all the way, Minari. And I believe that just after it won the uh, Audience Award for U.S. Dramatic mm -hmm. Feature and also the Grand Jury Prize, the very top award for U.S. Uh, dramatic Feature. But if you want to talk about a performance, Jeff, pay attention to this. Amazing. If you want to talk about a performance that is going to go all the way and a performance that we will be talking about quite a bit on season three of Collider videos for your consideration, hashtag Collider FYC. This is Anthony Hopkins in The Father. Let me tell you something. You said Minari was a movie that stayed with you. Mm -hmm. The Father was a movie that stayed with me. It was the second to the last movie that I saw at the festival before I split. And it is a movie that stayed with me in such an unnerving way. Anthony Hopkins plays an 80 year old man who's uh, just slipping into dementia. And the movie is written and directed by Florian Zeller. That's his feature film debut, but the movie is based on his plays, a French filmmaker playwright. It is not like the sort of Alzheimer's dementia performance that you might've seen before with let's say Julian Moore, who won the Academy Award for playing uh, an early Alzheimer's uh, 
uh, patient in, in Still Alice. This movie is done in such a way where you don't even realize while you're watching it because it's done so subtle that you are kind of experiencing the loss of memory and the confusion that Anthony Hopkins' character is is experiencing himself. You know, a lot of times, like, there might be some special effects or editing techniques done to sort of show what dementia or Alzheimer's might feel like. But this is done in such a way where you're watching it, wondering, like, wait, where did this person come from? What happened to that location? What's going on here where you actually have to go back and see it again the second time and even though you've already seen it it winds up being a more rewarding experience the second time because you are paying closer attention to it having said all of that what anthony hopkins does with this role is it you know oscar bait absolutely but i took the bait because this is this is his king lear now, Anthony Hopkins already has a lead actor Oscar, of course, for Hannibal Lecter in Silence of the Lambs. But correct me if I'm wrong, Perry and Jeff, uh, that that's like one of the shortest screen times for a best actor winner in Oscar history. Mm -hmm. Like really should have been a supporting role, but he got lead and he won for it. This is, he's in every single scene of the movie. And it is a towering performance. It is a career defining performance. So much so that after the movie, in the uh, lobby at Eccles Theater, I saw Michael Barker, who's one of the co-heads of Sony Pictures Classics, which picked up, actually, they went into Sundance with the movie. And I said to him, this, this is his Oscar movie. And he, like, shook his head, like, you know, in a way, like, yeah, mm -hmm. I know it is. And there's, there's a reason why Sony Pictures Classics is going to release this movie in the fall. When more people see this movie... And, and I'm telling you, he's guaranteed to get nominated for sure. Anthony Hopkins is the father. There you go. <laughs> that was, that was <laughs> given with so much confidence. Like I felt, <laughs> now I feel too wishy-washy about Minari, but you know, it's no, no, a, no, no, you, know, it's you a, sold it's, me on Minari. I, I get it. It's a different game uh, award season wise, playing it with uh, A24 versus a Sony Pictures Classics. Oh, hey, but sure. you never know, things could change. Um, <laughs> we have one more movie to hit each and uh, I saved this one for last because it just so happens that all three of us picked the same movie. Uh, who wants to say it? Jeff, you go. Promising Young Woman. Yeah. Yes. What a movie. That yeah. was great. Um, I still kind of can't believe what this turned out to be because I said it during our review that we recorded in Park City. I watched the trailer for this and I guess uh, I guess my impression of it was it was going to be more of like a, a playful, fun, vigilante type story and have more of that vibe. But how much further it goes beyond just that initial long line, just that like, I guess I could call it kind of a high concept, really wowed me. And when you think about the range that Carrie Mulligan has to show off in a role like that, it is something else. And even though she's got a resume down to the floor at this point, <laughs> I think that the kind of stuff that she does in this movie is something that we've never quite seen before from her. And I applaud her all day long and really every single person in that ensemble. You know, you, you bring up a good point, Perry, because I know that when we talked about this at Sundance, that I, I said that I thought the movie was gonna go in a certain direction. It certainly had the sort of look, the production design, where I thought it was gonna go into like atomic blonde territory. And and for a little while, Jeff, you and I were at the same screening. I thought it, was, it felt like, wow, this really feels like a South by Southwest movie. But then ultimately, because it didn't go where I thought it was going to, ultimately it was actually a perfect Sundance movie and the kind of movie that Sundance is all about. I thought Carrie Mulligan was absolutely superb. One of the best things I've ever seen her do. The movie already has a distributor, Focus Features. It's gonna be in theaters uh, in New York and LA at least, and then platform from there on April 17th. What did you think, The In Snyder? I mean, I, I went into it thinking that I knew, you know, more about it than, than was really out there. And I was surprised because I didn't see the end of this movie coming. Um, but it's not just about the end. And, and um, I think it's about the journey. Uh, 
It, yep. it was just a very entertaining movie. Like you could go back to any of the scenes, and I, I, I think it's going to prove to be very rewatchable. Mm -hmm. um, All right, I, I agree. Yeah, I thought Carrie was great. The, the supporting cast was fantastic: Connie Britton, Alison Brie, Alfred Molina, uh, and and again, just a tremendous debut from Emerald Fennell. Yeah, absolutely. I tend to really take to movies where every single scene in it feels very full, where mm, obviously it mm. all connects into one big story, but yep. where it's almost like mini stories in each, and scenes aren't just you to get a character from one place to another. And I think this movie has that kind of quality to well, it. Well, you know, Jeff, you said it's, it's more about the journey than it is about the end. I agree with you, but the ending is amazing oh, and yeah. shocking and unexpected. And there's also a doozy of a plot twist near the end, which I did not see coming. And I think overall the, the strength of a promising young woman is that the way it's sort of a, a, a genre bending film. It's hard to to classify it as any one thing. It's not. It's a revenge thriller, but it's more than that. In, in the middle part, it kind of turns into a bit of a rom romantic comedy a little bit, but of course, it's much much more than that. But along the way, like you said, Perry, every scene is fully realized and feels like a mini story mm -hmm. unto itself. Perfect way to sum this movie up. So that covers our top three. But very very briefly, uh -huh. do I dare open the door to? Honorable mentions. Are there any other titles you just briefly want to throw out there? Jeff. All right, I'll go. Uh, I love, look, I love the Go-Go's. The documentary okay. is one of the only documentaries that I saw up at Sundance this year. Uh, I grew up with the Go-Go's, but the, and, and listen, as far as like behind the music type tropes where it shows them struggling, rising, being family, and then getting the fame and the wealth and then fighting and then getting, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, all the tropes are there. But the perspective of the Go-Go's that they were a trailblazing, all female group. They played their own instruments, wrote their own stuff, and uh, they weren't put together by some entrepreneur guy like like a lot of these boy bands. And yet, they are not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. The perspective of the Go Go's was was one that was uh, really refreshing, and just I just love the music, and I love all five of them. They're awesome. All right, I'm going to run down my honorable mention list. I'm in the minority on this one, but downhill, I haven't seen Force Majeure, so that might be why I felt I so it. strongly about it. Yeah, I've just seen a lot of uh, opposing opinions lately, but I thought the comedy and just you know the uh, the underlining serious nature of that story really played well together. Never rarely, sometimes always is phenomenal. Oh, yeah, a a really too. great uh, performance showcase there. I'm a big fan of David Bruckner, so I like the night house quite a bit and speaking of a performance showcase oh my god rebecca hall is so good in that and then also the killing of two lovers is one that really surprised me uh it's uh it's a film that shot largely in uh in in single shots like a scene just plays out in one shot and the actors in it are absolutely incredible so just four titles worth uh being aware of there oh good to know all right the same number uh the ren and T stimpy documentary yes. happy, oh that happy, was great joy happy, joy happy, was joy, really joy. really good it waits a little too long to address the allegations against its creator sure, um, but Lewis. once they do uh, get into that stuff I thought it, I thought it was excellent um, the climb really impressed me yeah. the Sony Pictures classics yeah, comedy that's a good one uh, lost girls the Netflix drama about the the Craigslist serial killer on Long, Long Island who is still out there operating it's a tremendous performance from from Amy Ryan who doesn't get to really play a lead all that often and then over the weekend I had a chance to check out dinner in America starring uh, Kyle Gallner and I thought it was just very charming you and, got a uh, review of sweet. that up right uh, I'm going to be reviewing that soon uh, this week, but it was just a very charming, sweet love story in a punk package. Uh, you know what? I, I didn't realize you were going to go through like a bunch. Uh, the other movie that I really, really did take to is called Miss Juneteenth, mm. uh, uh, written and directed by Channing Godfrey Peoples, and it's about a mother and daughter in Texas, uh, a beauty pageant uh, uh, of the mother did this beauty pageant, now it's her daughter's turn. And the movie doesn't have a whole big story to tell, but it's just a really charming family dynamic. The movie itself, it feels very, very lived in. It feels very genuine and honest. I really, it really warned me over and I did love Happy, Happy, Joy, Joy. Can we Go ahead. Can we talk about what we didn't like? This is just oh. too positive. No, no, go ahead. Well, all right, all right. Yeah, right. let's hit. Okay, wait, open wait. the door. Can I ask you, what was your least favorite movie of the festival? It was Scare Me. It was this movie okay, that okay. I saw with Aya Cash from You're the Worst, and it was just two people doing bad improv for two hours in a cabin. It was horrible. All right. Uh, my lowest was uh, The Nest. It just was not for me. It was so dreary and sad, and I didn't really get anything out of it. I can't take away from the performances in that movie. Uh, Carrie Coon, as always, is incredible, but whoa, was that a drag. Uh, oh, geez. Wait a minute. I cannot believe I didn't put this movie on my list of what I loved. Sorry. 
I got to talk about worth. Just briefly, worth. Michael Keaton plays Ken Feinberg, who uh, initiated the 9-11 Victims Compensation Fund. And this movie, I saw it on a, on a Saturday morning, so I was refreshed. You know, I wasn't, like, tired. But it just was a very uh, fascinating film about a real hero who was, was not a hero initially. Uh, people didn't see him that way, but he came around. And the movie really took me back to 9-11. It really was very effective in that way. Michael Keaton gives a terrific performance. I think whoever picks up worth and positions just the right way, it could be like a spotlight kind of a movie, not just because of Michael Keaton. What did good. you not like, Scott yeah. Man? I didn't love Zola. I didn't love Zola. Okay. Okay. Uh, it just wasn't for me. Uh, I didn't feel that the story really came together. I felt like it was a, you know, I, I get a lot of people loved it. I, I think it was a daring, ambitious film. But for me, it didn't come together, and that's why it was not a favorite. Zola and the Nest were also on my uh, list of dislikes, along with Run, Sweetheart, Run, which I don't think I'm alone on. All right. There you go. Well, that's it. That is our recap of Sundance 2020. Uh, just in case you haven't done so yet, please go on over to Collider.com. There is a huge list of reviews that you could check out that Adam Chitwood and Matt Goldberg worked on. My roommates. There, there's something else, and so is their work. And then on top of that, go on over to the Collider Interviews YouTube channel, and you could see all the interviews I did, Jeff did, Steve Weintraub did. We have so much content. It's crazy. Quickly. Where can everyone find you on Twitter? Everyone can find me on Twitter at MovieMance, on Instagram at MovieMance, or you can find me, Collider FYC, with these two fine folks. Yes, and Jeff, where are you on the socials? I don't even know. I'm, I'm at the Insider Snyder for like another <laughs> couple months, guys. Oh, <laughs> don't... You're, you're going to rethink that. I don't, I don't know that uh, I am. I'm at Pete Emeroff on Twitter and Instagram. Big thank you for watching this video. Don't forget to like and share it, and we're going to see you soon with, with FYC, movie reviews, you name it.